It's been billed as a generational battle, Africa's gaze turning to Uganda and the tense homestretch to Thursday's presidential and legislative elections. 38-year-old pop star come opposition leader Bobby Wine among nine uh, candidates taking on 76-year-old Uweri Museveni, the former military leader whose national resistance movement took the capital way back in 1986. The tension palpable with fresh claims of intimidation, arrest, and on the last day of campaigning, a social media shutdown deemed by telecoms operators to be retaliation over the closing of pro-government Facebook accounts accused of spreading disinformation. Despite the long odds and repeated violence that includes last November's bloodbath that left more than 50 dead over two days, this election could be tighter than most. How tight and how much of a bellwether will it be for democracy after a 2020 that saw, well, a mixed bag when it came to elections on the continent? Museveni, just one of a long list of leaders who's had term limits or age limits lifted to stay in power long. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking which way for Uganda. And uh, joining us uh, is human rights attorney Sarah Buridi, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Governance. Thank you for joining us from Kampala. Thank you. Good evening. We also want to welcome uh, independent journalist uh, Evelyn Leary, who uh, recently uh, interviewed uh, Bobby Wine for the Africa Report. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And we'll be joined just in a moment by uh, Cameroonian journalist Louis Magloire Kumayou, chair of the African Information Club, the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, the day began with Bobby Wine claiming another raid on his home, a claim denied by police in the final hours of campaigning. The airwaves of national radio and television uh, were set to be open to the incumbent. Gareth Garland has more. Two days before the election, Uganda's main opposition candidate urged voters to end the rule of incumbent president Yoweri Museveni. Robert Kyagulani, better known as Bobby Wine, alleged ongoing attacks by security forces against him and his team. Last night, one of our team members, my driver sometimes and uh, works mainly as a mechanic, one uh, Kateriga, was shot by the military and he passed away this morning. And again this morning, my house was raided. A Kampala police spokesperson denied Wine's home was raided, saying officers were just removing checkpoints in the area. Wine is the most prominent among 10 candidates challenging Museveni. The former pop star has spent much of the campaign in a bulletproof vest and has been arrested multiple times. According to news agencies, the country's communications regulator ordered a shutdown of social media and messaging services on Tuesday, tools that the opposition relies heavily on to communicate. It came a day after Facebook took down accounts linked to the Ugandan Ministry of Information, saying it used fake and duplicate accounts to try to influence public opinion. The government accuses the social media giant of bias. After three and a half decades in power, the 76-year-old president is seeking a sixth term. The run-up to the vote has been marred by violent crackdowns on opposition rallies, ostensibly for violating COVID restrictions. Scores of protesters have been killed. Human rights groups have accused security forces of using excessive force, while regional observers have voiced concern. Uh, just remind for our viewers, Evelyn Leary, who don't follow uh, what goes on in, in Uganda closely, just who Bobby Wine is. So Bobby Wine is, uh, first of all, largely known here as a, a, a top star in Uganda. He, you know, he rose to fame because of his music. People loved his music because of the things that he was thinking about in the first place, you know, things that appealed to young people, things that appealed to youth, things that appealed to everyday, you know, people living in the urban slums of Kampala. So, you know, through his music, he's always raised uh, awareness about uh, the challenges that people face, issues about uh, poverty, issues about unemployment, issues about, you know, the education system in the country and the challenges that young, urban, poor people usually face. So uh, Bobby Wine was 
initially largely known for that. So when he came up to say he's standing for the president, you know, he was already someone, he wasn't really new to the public. He was someone that was already known because of his music. And so that made it even easy for people then to relate with him, but also the message that he brought about was something that people would easily relate with, you know, over, over time. He's been singing, he's been doing music, let's say, for, you know, about the last two decades. So that's quite a long time for the young people that have grown up listening to his music, you know, admiring him, knowing that this is someone who has grown up from a, a slum in, in the city Kampala to become one of the top musicians in the country. And that is something that has inspired very many young people to, you know, look up to him to say, if he can do it, he can come out of the slum and be where he is today, including, you know, contesting for the presidency. That is something that really inspires young people. And that's what he is largely known for. And how would you characterize uh, the, this this final day of campaigning with uh, with all the tensions that we saw described in that report? Uh, I mean, that, that is something that we've expected, you know, throughout uh, the campaign. We've seen Bobby Wine facing a lot of violence, facing a lot of intimidation. Uh, you know, he's barely campaigned, if we, if we say so, because every time he's going to a place where he's supposed to be campaigning, police is arresting him. So, you know, even in the final days or the last day of his campaign, when we see security officials going to his house, arresting anyone that they found there, it's not something that would surprise many people who have been following the event in the, in the city or in the country and seeing what has actually been happening to him. You know, he's, he's, if you think about it, you would say he's been one of the, those very persistent people. He's not given up, and that's what he always tells the young people, never give up, because if you give up, then you'll not reach or you'll not uh, achieve the things that you want to achieve. So despite the challenges, despite all the violence and intimidation that he's gone through, he always brings the message of never giving up. And I think even what happened today was something that he probably expected, and we, we are going to see more of that, you know, even on the election day, that is something that is likely to happen. Let's bring in at this point a member of parliament, Emmanuel Dombo from President Museveni's National Resistance Movement. Thank you so much for joining us here on France 24. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure for me to be part of this panel. Uh, tell me, uh, first of all, your reaction to uh, to what happened uh, this morning, Bobby Wine interrupting a radio interview, saying there was a raid going on at his house. I think uh, at times our security operatives have conducted themselves with some excesses, and they have uh, made reports to say they have done that because of some intelligence reports about what could have been either somebody was on radio inciting people or there could have been this intelligence information upon which the security act but you know unlike us security has is privy to a number of things that they use to conduct intelligence information upon which they make decisions but I've also known that uh, the security organizations in Uganda, some of them, have had excesses, and even at what sometimes the courts of law have said so. And uh, the fact that you, you have the, the main opposition candidate uh, who's campaigning with a flak jacket, your reaction to that? First of all, people may not be knowing that the success of Bobby Wine is one of the things, the contributions NRM government is proud of. So many years ago, musicians would not grow to the level Bobby Wine has grown and would not aspire for leadership positions. But because of the environment created by the NRM government and the peace that was ushered in when President Museven and his team went to liberate this country after a protracted war. Now people who have been trodden up upon in many times, 
like musicians and artists, have come up to volunteer and offer themselves for leadership positions. So the success of Bobby Wine is first and foremost a success of the contribution brought by the NRM administration, which was spearheaded by President M7. Secondly, people should also know that in the previous election, Bobby Wine did not offer himself as a member of parliament. Bobby Wine only offered himself as a, as a candidate when a court annulled the elections of the member of parliament who had been elected on an FDC ticket. And this annulment happened because a member of the NRM party, which I belong to, went to court in order to annul the election of a member of parliament who had been elected. And in a by-election, Bobby Wine got an opportunity to get elected. So people who criticize the democracy in Uganda should see that we have come very far and the people who are in professions that were previously not very popular are now aspiring for members of parliament because now we have about four or five musicians in parliament, a profession that many people used to despise. Let me bring in Sarah Bariti on this. Do you agree uh, with uh, uh, Emmanuel Dombo that um, Ugandan democracy has come a long way? Well, I don't know whether Uganda, Uganda's democracy, especially given the events that are happening today, I think we are moving in reverse order. But as uh, Honorable Dombo was explaining the rise of Bob Wine to be credited to NRM, Honorable Dombo needs to be reminded that uh, you know, the, the world is based now on knowledge, you know, the, the knowledge economy, the, the e-commerce, the digital world, and the innovative innovation industry, where the creative industry falls, is actually now the leader of the global economy, you know, everywhere. And it is not just an exception of NRM or credit of President Museveni, that the creative industry is the most lucrative industry now worldwide under the innovative industry and knowledge economy. But, but away from that, I think that the, our democracy today, given the four pillars of democracy, under rule of law, citizens' participation, social justice, you know, and, and equity, I think if we were to rank NIM based on the four pillars of democracy, I think it would not score above 30%. But also the context within which we are running this election, Given that an election is based on citizens' participation, transparency, freedom, and competitiveness, among others, with the high-handedness of security forces, with the failure of candidates to campaign, with the, co the, the harassment of journalists and lack of freedom of expression, I think that this kind of exercise that we are undertaking today falls far short of the minimum that is expected in a credible election. Will it be close nonetheless? Sorry? Will it be a close election nonetheless? The course of, ac the course of action. No, will, will the result be close is what I'm asking. Results. But you see, as of today, the, the, the government has shut down social media and the regulations of the Electoral Commission to say that observers have to keep so many meters away from the polling area and voters are not allowed to, to, to keep around and witness vote counting. You know, that takes away the element of transparency in an election, element of freedom of, of information, of access to information, and that takes away credibility of an election. So whether the results will be close, yes, it has been a competitive race, especially between President Museven and Bobby Wine 
Honorable Chagrany. It has been a competitive race, and the regime has been really put on pressure. Even the military deployment in Kampala today, we have, you know, Kampala is like Kosovo or Somalia. We are, we are in a war zone. Uh, there's a big, there's a big uh, de deployment of uh, the military the, 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 that was uh, witnessed uh, this uh, Tuesday ahead of the closing hours of the campaign. Louis Magrach um your thoughts on the shutdown of social media of uh, and of messaging apps? Well, I think there are leaders who don't notice we are changing era. We've been since 1884 and the Berlin Conference uh, facing Africans who are moving in the history and trying to fight for the dignity trying to fight for the freedom, trying to fight also for transition, political transition. There have been some leaders who fought for that. And after the independence, there were some freedom fighters like President Museveni who have done everything for the country to become free. We, they deserve all our respect. But the fact is that we've changed area and they don't understand in the current time. There are young leaders, as young as they were in the past, who also aim to bring the contribution to the development of democracy and the development of the country simply uh, as it is going on. If they are not able to help those young leaders become as strong as they were before, I think the mistake will be there. And all the violence we are seeing, all the, 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 all the restrictions we are seeing, uh, because of that, there is no dialogue between all those generations of, of citizens, simply. Yeah, huge generation gap, young population, old leaders across the continent. We'll pick up on that point when we come back. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and we're looking at the tense finale of a Ugandan presidential and legislative election campaign, the uh, final hours of uh, canvassing. Uh, on Thursday, they'll be voting with us to talk about a member of parliament, Emmanuel Dombo, uh, from President Museveni's National Resistance Movement, human rights attorney Sarah Baridi, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Government, as well as independent journalist Evelyn Leary. All thanks to you for being with us from uh, Kampala here in the studio. Cameroonian journalist Louis Magroir uh, Kumayou, uh, chair of the African Information Club. Louis Magroir, you were telling us uh, just before the break uh, about that generation gap. That's not just in Uganda, but the list is long in Africa, right, uh, uh, of countries we could talk about where there have been recent elections, where we see... Uh, uh, old incumbents uh, who've uh, been uh, uh, re-elected. Uh, um, the uh, incumbent president in Uganda uh, who uh, took power in 1986, overthrowing the brutal uh, military regime of, uh, um, of Milton Obote, um, has, in a speech back in November, uh, alluding uh, to being twice the age of his main rival. I keep hearing many of you talking, you young people, young people, young people, young people. That's good. But with the management of society, we are not talking about biology. We are talking about ideology. You can be young but confused. You can be old, also confused. You can be old and also confused, he says. Uh, Louis Macron, is that an argument, though, that carries? You know, that, uh, you know, there's this myth that in Africa, you know, you defer to the elders. Yes, it's good. I can't say that's not a good thing. We need to have some values we defend and we practice also in the society. But the fact is, when we are talking about ruling a country, it is not only a matter of fitness, because he also made some fitness to show, show us he's fit for the job. It is not only that. If you have already done what you can do after six terms uh, of ruling the country, I think even in your, same, in your party, you can find someone to continue the job. 
and make it better than you because you are probably a little bit aged for that and let those who are able to do it again for the time to do it. And when and, he's- and Just remind us, how old is the president of your native Cameroon? 82. 82 years old. President Paul Bia, and he was president since 1981. Since 1981. Yes. Uh, Emmanuel Dombo, at what point uh, do leaders pass the baton? Transition in leadership is defined by the various legal regimes of the different countries. And by the way, to inform our listeners, I am a former member of parliament and right now the spokesperson of the ruling party, the National Resistance Movement. Oh, thank you for correcting me. I'm the director, of, I'm the director for information at the Secretariat. Usually the constitutions of various countries define and categorize how the baton is passed over and in which manner. Some constitutions have term limits, some constitutions have age limits, Although there is no spiritual information or biological information to state how con somebody may contribute depending on age. But for us in Uganda, the constitution of the Republic of Uganda defines how transitions shall be done and the various parties determine how they will be electing the leaders in their respective parties. But your... Uh... Uh, median age in Uganda is 16. Uh, you have a very young population. Yuwari Museveni is the only president, the only leader they have known their whole lives. Isn't it time for a change? I think progressively change will be coming in in Uganda. It is a question of time. Because when you look at the composition of parliament, where I was for 20 years, most of the old people who are in parliament have transitioned and the respective constituencies have elected the younger people. There are also constituencies which are removing younger people and bringing in older people after trying the young people and failing to deliver on their promises. This is the beauty of democracy. Once people have the freedom of choice, they can either choose a younger person or an older person. But I want to tell you that if you look around the whole world and you see the uprisings that have been happening in various countries, there are many countries which have had uprisings, democratic uprisings, but they have failed to deliver on the promises that they gave their people. And they have regretted and wished they could go back to the previous administrations. There is no scientific proof but given what Uganda had been had gone through over 30 years before the coming in of the NRM administration, and given the stability that has been created over the years since the NRM administration came into power, it makes many people to get tempted to say you'd rather stay with the person you know and build a stable process of transition other than changing for the sake of having a young person who may not necessarily be, who may not measure to the job that somebody is aspiring to be. All right, let me, let me, put, let me put this to Sarah Bariti. Uh, Sarah, uh, I, I have gray hair around my temples here, so I am old enough to remember Idi Amin Dada, I'm old enough to remember uh, Milton Obote, but how many Ugandans remember them? Well, I, I personally, who is in my early 40s, I don't remember any of the two leaders. But I want to briefly comment on the process of transition, as a, commented by Honore Bodombo. Honore Bodombo did say that uh, some constitutions have term limits, others have age limits, but the Uganda constitution will determine the transition. He, however, forgot to mention that the NRM regime under the leadership of President Museveni has distorted the same constitution and the transitional arrangements that were enacted in the constitution with the consensus of the people. 
And this distortion of the removal of both term limits and age limits, amendments aimed at benefiting an individual and keeping him in power, have eroded the, the national consensus that was developed through a, a broad consultative process of Ugandans during the 1995 constitutional making process. The only exception that remains in our constitution as a way of transiting power is through free and fair, credible elections. Uganda is holding a sixth election under this distorted constitution, but all the previous elections have been found wanting by the Supreme Court of Uganda. And the, 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 the current election that Ugandans will go for on Thursday is far below the standard that was held in the previous elections, which were found wanting. Actually, it is painful to call this exercise that Ugandans have been subjected to an election because it does not qualify to be called as such. Evelyn Leary, uh, when we look ahead to Thursday's vote, how much has Uganda changed uh, since the last time we had a presidential poll? I mean, the, you can say that a lot has changed in terms of, you know, the kind of, you know, people who are contesting against President Museveni. We do not have people who have, you know, put a lot of pressure on him, as we have seen with Bobby Wine, like some, some of the previous uh, panelists have said, as Sarah said before, you know, the context has been very closely, you know, tight between President Museveni and Bobby Wine. And, that's be, and that has actually put a lot of pressure on him, but also the way the elections have been conducted this time. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Initially, we thought actually the elections were going to be postponed because, you know, the questions around were how are we going to conduct an election when, you know, in the midst of, uh, of a pandemic like COVID, which spreads so easily between people. But then I think they decided to go ahead with the election. I wouldn't call this an election, like the campaign process, I wouldn't actually call it a campaign process as such, because all we've seen is, you know, the president has not had any interaction on his side of the election. All the other opposition candidates have barely campaigned. So as Sarah already said, you know, the, you know, it's all below what we've seen before, where people are raising issues, where people were actually talking about the things that they will do if they get elected into into uh, to be, become president. But what we've seen in the last few months of the election is every day candidates are trying to campaign and then they get arrested, then they get in prison, then they get charged with, you know, things that they have actually never been, crimes that they've never been co convicted of. So at the end of the day, it's the stories that are being reported, it's all about, you know, Candidates, especially the opposition, being arrested, we've not had anything, anyone. Police has not stopped President Museven from going anywhere to campaign. But why is it that they are always going to stop all the opposition candidates? So it already shows you the level, field, the, play, the playing field has not been leveled as we go even into the elections on Thursday. That is something that most people are aware of, and we hope that... Uh, you know, we, we just hope for the best. It, it's hard to tell right now what will actually happen. And the whole continent, as we said at the outset, is watching Nigerian Nobel literature laureate Wally Shoyinka saying in a recent interview that he fondly remembers the Museveni who resisted against Idi Amin. But that was a long time ago. I met Museveni during the fight against Nigerian dictator Sani Abacha. At the time we met, it was still possible to consider him a democratic leader. Today, he's joined the gang, the enemies of society. And a uh, quote, how much in other parts of the continent, West Africa, are, are they watching Uganda right now? Yes, they're watching, but I think even uh, very close to Uganda, you have Rwanda, who also has, I think, the same organization in the social political uh, 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 term. Uh, when you see Rwanda, you have a president who 
has been elected more than two times, but who is still uh, running the country. There is not no a big opposition to him. He was in Uganda before going to Rwanda. And when you see how the two countries have been uh, evoluting in the time, it is not the same thing. He's made a revolution in Rwanda. What is going on in, in, in uh, Uganda is a regression of democracy. And I think they should understand that. People are trying to have change. Not only change as transition, but change in their lives, change in the conditions in living, having uh, basic services coming from the state, having uh, the comfort to live in the country, loving the country. And they don't have all of that now. And that is why they are fighting and looking for a new leader. I don't want to see what has happened in Zimbabwe or in Angola happen in Uganda. But that doesn't depend only of me or of the, uh, the population. That also depends on the leaders, if they can organize themselves in the party, in the country, to have a transition, a, 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 a slight transition for, for democracy and transition. I think that will be a good deal for everyone. Uh, are we on tenuous ground, Emmanuel Dombo, when we start comparing Uganda to some of its neighbors? And you heard uh, Louis Magloire there describe best and worst case scenarios, perhaps? The comparison that is being done about Uganda and its neighbors depends on who is comparing and what is it trying to achieve. But if you look at Uganda 35 years ago, Uganda did not have a government. There was no, almost no state. There was no economy. All the international credible institutions had run out of Uganda. Uganda was not credit worthy. Uganda had no name internationally, but you look at Uganda now. You are talking about Uganda that is credit worthy, it can be lent and it is able to pay its debts. If it was not for this COVID, that has made the reduction in the savings and the tax collection. If you look at Uganda, that can protect the children and its investments are going high. Uganda, which has discovered the oil and has progressively made laws that is going to protect our oil compared to many countries in Africa, what they had done. And when you see the consistency with which President Seven has been integrating the people who have fought against him and shot against him. But he has integrated them in order to build a consensus within the, the country, Uganda. When you look at these patients, many people take it for granted. But it's possible that once seven has gone, we could easily get some mad young person or old person who can come to retrograde, really to retard all the development and the processes that have grown. It is because of this that many people have stuck and said, let this old man continue superintending the process as the process of transition progressively comes in. President Museveni is a human being. Okay. The body will give way and he will definitely become old and old enough not to manage the affairs of state. All right, we're running short on time. We're running short on time. Evelyn Leary, I don't want to get involved now at this late part point in the discussion again about why Museveni opted to lift uh, a, the age limit and uh, run again uh, for president. But just about the prospects uh, for Uganda, how is it looking for ordinary citizens? When, when you look at... Uh, Let me put it to Evelyn Leary. Let me put it to Evelyn Leary. Let me put it to Evelyn Leary. Evelyn Leary. The children who are born can be because they are in the Yes, I can hear you. Should I? Oh, yeah. So I was saying, you know, I'm saying that when you look at what's happening right now, when Dumbo, uh, Honorable Dumbo, 
talks about, you know, we need to continue with the old man because of the stability. It doesn't necessarily mean that if a new person comes, they are going to do that. We need to give them a chance. That's how President Museven came with the promise that this is what we are going to do. And that's what all the other candidates are also, you know, uh, they, are, they are making promises to people because if you don't give them the chance, then how are they going to know this is what you stand for? And we've seen candidates actually come up, lay out what strategies that they want to 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 undertake if they they got elected. So I don't think the issue should be that all oh, the fear is that when you bring in someone, they should they would end up being you know whatever what we are seeing in some countries. I think every candidate deserves an opportunity to to be given that chance and not say that you know and not have that fear because that's how President Museven also came into power. But also the issue that he talked about. Earlier, you know, when we give power to the young people, then we're not very sure how they're going to, you know, use that power. President Museven himself came to power, I, I, you know, at the age of 41. That was fairly young. Bobby Wine is right now uh, 38. If we are talking about, you know, young, quote unquote. So, but people trusted him with, you know, giving them the hope that they had, that they had long lost. So I don't think the issue of age actually also just comes in, when, especially when we talk about young people not being able to leave the country. There are so many young people we've seen in so many countries that have come up, you know, not very young, but fairly young people, leaders who have come up. And those are the kind of people that people want to see. They want to see someone, you know, come up in whatever field they have come up from and, you know, give them hope, inspire them to also be where they should hope to be. All right. One final point, uh, and we're running short on time. In 2020, democracy bore mixed results uh, in East Africa and Tanzania. Uh, John Magufuli reelected, emitting a growing uh, clampdown on dissent, while Malawi earned the Economist's Country of the Year Award for ousting the incumbent at the ballot box in a rerun of a poll so blatantly fraudulent it was dubbed uh, the Tipex election, as in the brand of whiteout used to, to change uh, the results. Sarah Bariti, uh, very briefly, the future is unwritten when it comes to Uganda? Well, when it comes to Uganda, really, democracy is on trial. And uh, Honare Bodombo did say that uh, Uganda experienced recovery. Yes, we experienced recovery in the first years of President Museveni's rule. But we are now in regression. And he did mention that we could pay our debts. But as we talk now, Uganda's debt burden is actually, the economists in Bank of Uganda has warned that we do not have capacity to pay our debts. We should embark on a campaign for debt forgiveness for Uganda. So we are a highly indebted country. We have high levels of unemployment. We have high levels of patronage, elaborate patronage to keep President Museveni in power. We have a lot of partisanship and collapsing institutions that cannot hold and safeguard our democracy. So the, the, the situation in Uganda is that we are on a downward trend. And if President Museven gets another five years, the situation can only get worse. All right. Uh, that's one uh, perspective. I want to thank you, Sarah Bariti, for joining us. I want to thank... Uh, uh, former member of parliament, Emmanuel uh, Dumbo, for, for being with us as well from the Ugandan capital. Evelyn Leary, Louis Magrach-Kamayou, thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.